Okay, here we are. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for anyone who uh, joined us after the commencement of this evening, uh, I just want, to, just want to welcome you on behalf of the uh, directors and editors guild at New Zealand. My name is Gabriel Reed, and uh, it's terrific to have you here at this uh, very special screening of Goodbye Pork Pie, made especially special um, by the fact that it coincides with the release of Jeff Murphy's memoir, A Life on Film, which I've had the pleasure of reading over the past week, uh, thanks to the, an advanced copy from the publisher, so thank you for that. Um, Jeff Murphy's directed 17 feature films in five countries. Uh, in 2013, the Arts Foundation of New Zealand made him one of its icon of the arts, an honour that can only be held by tw 20 living persons at any given time. In 2013, he received a MOA, with the New Zealand Film Award, for a lifetime achievement in film. Uh, then, in 2014, he was awarded the ONZM before receiving an honorary doctorate in literature from Massey University. Uh, what does all this mean? Well, it means, among other things, that in a recent dispute with his local council, he was able to sign a letter, Dr. Jeff Murphy, Doctor of Literature, Icon of the Arts, NZ, ONZ, or whatever the effort is. <laughs> they came round the next morning. <laughs> yeah, that sorted it. <laughs> so, uh, the middle son of three boys. Um, your father, Vernon, was an ex-soldier and then became a civil engineer uh, for New Zealand Railways, indeed. And you attended a strict Catholic school and observed at close range the waterfront like out of 1951, which I gather sort of informed a, 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 should we call a healthy degree of cynicism in terms of your attitude toward authority. Um, and in the memoir, it's one of the things that really strikes me is that those of you who were involved in uh, endeavouring to make films at a certain period didn't, didn't it, it wasn't simply difficult, but there were forces that were outright obstructive. Uh, you had to smuggle filmmaking equipment into the country. Yeah, that's right. They didn't want us to do it, <laughs> did they, Ian? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have Ian Mune here. Uh, many of you may know, but Ian contributed uh, enormously to the um, creation of the film we've just seen. Mm. Yeah, they did. They were very obstructive. They, as far as television and the film unit were concerned, they had been gifted a God-given right to make films in New Zealand and no one else was to do it, anyone that attempted to do so was an upstart. <laughs> well, we were, fortunately there were a few upstarts around <laughs> um, right. and so we did it anyway. Fantastic. And so after a period of uh, a career, would, would a career as a teacher be too big a word? A, a, <laughs> A, a, a period teaching, uh, you uh, really got stuck into filmmaking and I mean it would, there was a very strong sense that there were a community, Al, Alan Bollinger who was the DOP, Al Boll, who shot many uh, fine New Zealand feature and many an international feature also, uh, Ian, Martin Sampson, a good number of others who were uh, Brenna Lawrence. Uh, who were determined to make it happen come uh, hell or high water. Do you want to talk a little bit about how the story for Goodbye Pork Pie was arrived at? I understand someone came to dinner with an unusual story. A friend of Martin Sanderson's, is that right? Yeah, some joker turned up <coughs> at Waimarama. And he'd had a lift in a, in a car that turned out to be a rental and they were selling the jack and the spare tyre to some garage attendant. <laughs> this guy thought, I don't want to get out of here. <laughs> he wanted to lift, he didn't want to be involved in a criminal activity. And so that started me writing the script. But um, I got to a certain point with it and I approached the Film Commission for money to develop it further. I think I wanted five thousand dollars, and uh, they, because um, they wanted to send it out for assessment, because uh, evidently they can't tell a good script if it bites them on the ass. So, 
So they send them out for assessment to a lot of other people who can't tell a good script if it bites them on the ass. <laughs> and uh, we got back a lot of very bad assessments, actually. And they decided, um, there were a couple of good ones amongst it. I think one was from a 16-year-old boy. Um, and they decided they would let, let me do it. They let me develop it further. But they did it in extremely bad grace. They sort of, it reminded me of when I was a kid, and when I was a teenager and I wanted to borrow my father's car, you know, I'd ask him and he would throw the keys on the ground and shout and rave and get them. And I had to bend down and pick them up, you know. And that was sort of the same feeling I got from the Film Commission. So, so I rang up Ian Mann. And I said, Ian, I'm, I'm so I'm discouraged by the response to this that I'm wondering whether I should become the first filmmaker in history to return all the Film Commission's money and just send it back. <laughs> And uh, I sent him the script and said, tell us if there's too much in here to walk away from. That was, that was the question, wasn't it? Very much. And he read it and said, yeah, no, there is far too much. And I, I think it's a go. And I said, well, do you want to help us do it? <laughs> and he said, too right. And I said, do you want to direct it? <laughs> and he said, too right. I said, OK, you direct the actors and I'll direct the action. Um, and that's how we went into it. But unfortunately, like, he then he withdrew later because he thought he could get... Um, into the golden get, weather. Yeah, into the golden weather off the ground. And, but it didn't happen as quickly as he hoped, so... But it did happen, and it was a beautiful, beautiful film. Too. Yeah. Right, so, and you, you formed a little consortium, and you, which was largely a contribution of um, goods and services, uh, you with some guys who were working in advertising, and, and the railway, New Zealand Railways, came to the party to an yeah. almost unbelievable degree, to the extent that yeah, I mean, you really couldn't have done it right without there. Yeah, there, there was a joke that worked for the railways called Gene Saunders. His Gene name Saunders, was. yeah, yeah. And he was a public relations guy. And uh, I said, oh, "We'll put your name on the poster." <laughs> 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 you know, like, what could we offer the railways? We had no money. Right. And then it was uh, Don Blakeney who really found, who had, uh, was running the Film Commission and, and found a way of getting the balance well, he, of the money that was needed. Well, he uh, uncovered the tax shelter. Right. Scam. Right. <laughs> I think you describe it as a, as a tax loophole that you could drive a mini through. Yeah. Um, so we shot with a crew of 20, six mm. weeks shoot from Kaitaia to Invercargill, about a thousand miles. Um, and you were seeing the rushes, they were hardly rushes, were they? It was, they were two weeks old by the time you were seeing them because they yeah. had to be sent to Australia before you got them back. So um, that, that would have been interesting. Too late to turn, you were committed, right? Too late to turn back. Yeah. There was something wrong. I, I think Kaitai to Invercargill was more like 1,200 miles, isn't it? <laughs> what did I say? It's, it's a thousand, it's about a thousand from Auckland in Invercargill. Right. If, when you go down there, it feels like it's 10,000 from right, right. <laughs> yeah. And there are in the book some terrific stories, but the, I mean, the, the instance, for example, where Alistair Barry was driving the Mini at speed, and there were different license plates on the front and the back, which is a big no-no. <laughs> the doors had been rigged already to be able to be removed at high speed, and a police officer with an eagle eye actually started chasing the Mini, right? But he was he didn't want to stop because he knew <laughs> that he was about to pull into shot. Do you want to pick up the story? <laughs> yeah, he came screaming onto the film set with the cop ch car chasing him. And the cop car pulled up behind him and the cop was so fixated on getting, getting his man that he jumped out of the car and rushed over and grabbed the door handle. And the door came off in his head. <laughs> Because <laughs> it was never bolted on properly. We, we, we didn't bolt them on, we just sort of fitted them in and showed to the next location. I don't know, I think the, fun, the funniest thing was the look on the cop's face, really. <laughs>
All right. Well, do we want to open up uh, for some questions? Does anyone have uh, a yeah, question let's, that they'd like to hear from you, Jack? Yeah. Ask, uh, yeah. ask Mr. Murphy. Yeah. Oh, right yeah. over here. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi, Jeff. Good to uh, good to talk to you. Um, when I was 12 years old, my, I asked my mother to take me to pork pie. I think it was at the St. James on Queen Street. And um, at that time, I'd already been able to get into R13s. Uh, but when we arrived, the uh, ticket lady asked my mother how old I was, and she said, he's 12. And we were turned away, so I never got to see it. Um, I, <laughs> I later wore out a, v a VHS copy, but tonight was the first time I actually saw it in a theater. So, very, uh, uh, very nice experience. Thank you. <laughs> But you can see why. I mean, that was a fairly <laughs> corrupting film. <Well. laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my question is, uh, you've directed uh, Mick Jagger, uh, Steven Seagal, and my favorite actor, actually, Mickey Rourke. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experiences with those, those yes. performances. So the question is, um, uh, uh, I suppose the time you spent in Hollywood directing Mickey Rourke, Mick Jagger, and Steven Seagal, and directors of that ilk. Yeah, yeah. I, I enjoyed all. I, I really enjoyed working with all three of those guys. Um, Stephen Seagal's a total loony, of course, and um, very hard to direct because he believes himself to be a genius, and it's hard to direct a genius because they know everything already. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, Mick was great fun to work with, you know. But very much not an actor and didn't see himself as an actor, so he was very kind of humble to work with. And Mickey Rook, well, he's just something else. <laughs> yeah, he was great. You've had an, a particularly interesting career in the sense that, you know, you created Goodbye Pork Pie, Utu, uh, Quiet Earth, and then uh, spent a reasonably extended period in in yeah, Hollywood, and, and there are some terrific stories. I mean, for uh, I, I urge you to, to pick up a copy of the memoir because there are some some wonderful tales of Hollywood excess and, and, and kind of madness and 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 projects that uh, bore fruit, and uh, but not necessarily with you leading them all the way through. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, for example, of the Predator project that you developed and, and were involved in for a long time, and then of course that was picked up by by another director, and a few experiences of that sort along the way. And, um, but, but an interesting time in your life, I'm sure. Yeah. <clears throat> um, any other questions from out there? Um, first of all, Dr. Murphy, thank you very much for 38 years of my life and beautiful cinema and art. It's been an honor to grow up with your films. Um, and as a not so young filmmaker who wants to make countercultural films about the New Zealand condition, what would you give me as advice? <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's a so filmmaker, I'm just repeating. What do you say to that, <laughs> I'm just going to repeat the question for so so there, a problem. There um, is a problem with it. New Zealand films are chronically underfunded, they always have been. By design, the government won't give a, enough money to the Film Commission to fund films properly, so the Film Commission doesn't fund them properly. By policy, it will not give you the budget for a film, it'll only give you a certain percentage of it. And everybody has knows that New Zealand films can't make any money, that it's a surefire way of losing money to invest in films. So, what does the director do? He's given enough, <coughs> half enough money maybe to make a picture. But the Film Commission won't talk to the director anyway. He wants a producer to come aboard because the, he wants someone to go and find the other half, somehow inveigle other people to put the money up. So there's always this, the films are dominated by money. This continual search for money and there's never quite enough and the film is constantly under pressure to be bent so that it'll make more money, but because it never makes enough anyway. I mean, films like Pump by are very unusual in as much as, God, I don't know how many New Zealand films have made their money back completely and from receipts, I, I haven't a clue. It wouldn't be, what would your guess be, Ian? Yeah? Four or five 
five. Four or five max. So it's just really difficult. I mean, films like Utu, which was expensive, wouldn't have made a tenth of his budget back, you know. So um, it is an industry that can only exist on patronage. But it's a kind of refusal by the powers that be to admit that. And so they dominate the industry with producers who are only interested in money. And there isn't any, so <laughs> it's, it's just stupid, really. <laughs> so I don't know what a young filmmaker would do, would do. He has to go out and find a producer. We don't, we don't have a microphone in the audience, so just for the sake of the record, I'm going to repeat the questions. And that was just a, a, a young uh, New Zealand filmmaker seeking advice on how to get a project yeah. on its feet. But um, there wants, may be somebody in the room who can. He wants to know if there's a producer in the house. Wants to know if there's a producer <laughs> in the house. So. <laughs> um, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. Uh. We've got a question right up the back there, yes. Back. And when, we'll in the early days when you were making films and, and feeling frustrated because there was no money, did you think that that situation was going to improve? And did you ever get to the point where you thought, well, you know, what yeah. the hell am I doing this for? Did you ever feel tempted to give up yeah. um, because of a lack of resource in the early well, days? It did. It did improve. Um, when uh, when uh, Scrubbers discovered tax shelter, it got applied more and more across a whole range of films. And all those films were made with with tax shelter support. Now, it's not the best way to fund because it's a way I used to call it the Robin Hood syndrome in reverse, where you rob from the poor and give it to the rich, you know. But um, and that they did get films funded to a reasonable level. Um, so all those films like came out Friday and uh, Smash Palace and Utu and the Quiet Earth and were all made under that regime and they were properly funded and it was it was all going and then uh, until the government pulled the plug on it and the government pulled the plug on it of course because well they don't like to see people having fun really <laughs> <laughs> but also because of the foreigners going on you know there's, there's always all these thieves and Robertson are called the film industry and they wait out there to looking for ways of taking, ripping off taxpayers' money to, for their projects. And they're very good at it. Um, I think the world champions at the moment are Warner Brothers. They just got 200 million of New Zealand taxpayers' money to help pay for Peter Jackson's uh, trilogy of uh, non-New Zealand films. So, you know, that's how it is out there. If you, it's really, really difficult. It's not impossible, and people are doing it. They're still doing it, you know, because the thing about it is that modern technology has made the means much more available than they ever were. You can get a camera at a reasonable cost and it'll shoot colour. And, it'll, and the sound is recorded on the track in sync. You know, all these things were huge problems to us and poor by days. But nowadays, any, anyone can do it and they can cut it at home on their laptop and they, you know, I mean, and people are, and they're making films. But um, it's really difficult to get a, the quality. You can sort of, I don't know how it is that the audience can sort of tell how much is spent on a film. <laughs> and they'd like it to cost a lot of money. <laughs> so, um, I don't wish to be that uh, throw cold water over a young filmmaker's ambitions, but all I'm saying is I got out of the industry because I couldn't stand the bullshit any longer. <laughs> okay, sorry. You yeah. almost touched on uh, the question I was going to ask in, in response to these uh, you know, new uh, filmmakers with everything becoming cheaper to make. Um, and you've mentioned the word fun. 
Now, we go to the movies for fun, and I'm sure the people who make movies, they make them for fun, not for money. So now, making films is easier, let's say, and showing them is, cuts the distributors and the exhibitors out of the picture as well with um, the, the internet and other ways of disseminating the movie. Where do you think the future, uh, gi given that the econ economic model doesn't really work, it, you know, the, the big budget movies don't make money, and half of it's a marketing budget anyway. With new emerging filmmakers, how do they tell their stories? How do they get their stories out? Well, it's really difficult. They keep talking about the internet as a way of distribution and all that, but I've yet to hear a convincing <coughs> description of a way of making money out of it. Um, they haven't yet managed to do that. And um, they might be the odd one that does, but I don't know how they do it. It's certainly true that the, the model of distribution has been radically destabilised by technology, and which is, uh, you know, has potentially many benefits, but I think it seems like the economic model and precisely how that's going to work hasn't quite been pinned down yet. And certainly, you know, there's nothing to suggest that VOD income, for example, is yet um, compensating for the loss in, in the home video market and, and what have you. So it's a, it's a, in, it seems to be in great flux right now, I would say. Um, yeah. but, you mentioned the name of a good friend of mine, Alistair Barry, who yeah. makes these documentaries, these important stories, but he has huge trouble getting any funding. Yeah. And, he, and it's, but he needs to tell the story. He, he's, he a, he's, a, he's a political filmmaker, and he's, he's very passionate about what he does. And he's this is not, Alistair Barry. Yeah, yeah, he's not the slightest bit interested in making a film uh, unless it's about burning on important questions and he doesn't care about box office or money or any other, and, you know. Um, and, and consequently, very few people see his films, which is a real tragedy. Yeah, mm. yeah he, he's heard mm. that, that not more people can see his, 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 uh, no. his film. But what's the future? What's the future? That's the I, question. <laughs> I don't know what the future is. I know that nowadays they're saying things like, What's the, you know, if you go to the Film Commission, they'll say, what's your target audience, you know? And the traditional answer was always, oh, it's, you know, people between the age of 18 and 30, because that's the film-going audience. Well, it ain't any more. People between the age of 18 and 30 don't go to the pictures. They steal the pictures and download them onto their computers and watch them. They won't pay for anything. The, the film going audience that will buy money at the theatre tends to be from 50 upwards. <laughs> and that's the reality. You go to these boutique cinemas around, like this one probably, and you'll find quite a high age group goes to see them. Um, but I don't, it's not like, see, when we go to Port Pie and Queen Street, at, 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 was at the region, I think it was, we were getting 2,000 people in that cinema every night, you know, for weeks. Well, at that rate, you can start paying some bills, you know. <laughs> Whereas now, there's, I don't think there's a cinema in the country that will hold 2,000. Yeah. Um, this is a big one. But... Um, Popeye sold initially in its first outing to 21 countries and ultimately to 40. It paid for three yeah, months yeah. in Queen Street and was seen by about 600,000 um, uh, paying cinema goers uh, at a time when I guess the population of New Zealand would have been three, a little over three million, I suppose. Um, so it was an extraordinary sort of cultural uh, moment, wasn't it? Yeah, well, when you, when you actually look at, when you look at all those films around that period, um, millions of New Zealanders saw them. Millions. I mean, just Paul Piotr and the Quiet Earth. If you count television audiences as well, you know, you're talking about millions of people seeing them. Um, and so our, those films touched a lot of people's lives, and that was one of the big reasons for doing the memoirs, really, was 
to try and, you know, say hi to all those people whose, whose lives are touched by it. I have a question which was sent in by um, email, and forgive me, I'm just going to have to read this from the screen. Uh, this gentleman uh, who calls himself Onion Thieves is unable to be with us this evening, uh, but very much wanted to be here, but he has a, a question that he particularly wants to put to you. He said that in the director's cut, you edited out the scene where the two guys are talking about atom bombs, the nature of actions, reactions, etc., while they're hiding the mini in the Southland bush. And it's a genuine question for me, this fellow, as a or woman, as a budding filmmaker. Uh, to me, that scene served as a turning point in the final act. So I'm just curious to know why Mr. Murphy thought it didn't work and chopped it out. He's a big fan of the movie. I'd be interested in his response. Um, it, it goes back to that whole thing. I Most of my movies, and, I, and it's probably my fault for not... Um, being more of an asshole to all these people. Um, I haven't made a film, like, Pork Pie went and sold 24 countries to Khan, and then Lindsay Shelton, who was the, the sales marketing manager for the film commission, claimed that they could sell a lot more countries if it went faster. So they came back demanding a recut of it. Now, at least they were demanding a recut that you could sort of understand. If someone says, make this film go faster, you go, I can do that, you know. And uh, so they cut out things like that discussion, which I really miss. <laughs> that, that ridiculous discussion to people smoking dope and talking about the meaning of, of cause and effect. And the fact that they're talking a lot of bullshit to each other because they're stoned, you know, and that's the point of it. I mean, the, the whole point of if you go through the pork pie and cut out all the non sequitur dialogue, <laughs> there wouldn't be a lot left with the end. <laughs> I mean, it's just, they talk nonsense. It held a lot of the time. But um, it doesn't seem to matter because the story continues and everyone goes on with it. But that was done by the marketing people, and the marketing people have to will inflict all manager, manner of damage to the picture. In fact, they've bloody near destroyed Utu. And I was able to... Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, there, there yeah. was a case where you got to revisit in a very significant way a work yeah. after a, a considerable passage of years. How was that, to go back and... Oh, it was great. I mean, I really enjoyed it. Um, and we we made a lot of changes to it. With Michael Horton and John yeah. Howe as yeah, the editing had, team on that. Yeah, we had the original editors mm -hmm. and stuff. And we were able to make the picture better, even than it was originally. We, first of all, we had to put it back together how it was originally. Go back to the original <laughs> leg and, yeah. and scanning that. Well, we couldn't even do that because uh, when the producers recut it, they recut the original leg. They hacked up the original leg. Oh, wow. And so there was stuff missing, well, but right. um, we took it out to out to uh, Miramar, you know, to Peter Jackson's outfit. And they were able to reconstruct the missing pieces from, you know, Duke Neggs and things like that and enhance the quality so that you could never tell. They were, look, they can do anything. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. In the memoir, you give an account of, of seeing a, a lot of the actors with whom you'd worked and being yeah. quite moved by seeing it brought back in that way. And, and yeah. some of them had passed on by the time we, you were seeing the film again. Oh, yeah, yeah. But getting back to that, that guy's question about the, the atom bomb, uh, there was some talk when they... See, when I was in Hollywood when they um, re-scanned Paul Pye and they re-scanned you know, Lindsay Shelton's version. <laughs> should say directed by Lindsay Shelton, that one, shouldn't it? Um, but um, now they're looking at it again and saying that scan wasn't, you know, the, in the years that have passed since, the, the technology of scanning has improved so much, they're thinking of re-scanning it. 
and not giving them notice that if they're thinking of rescaling, we'll put the bloody atom bomb back in. <laughs> and we'll put the wizard back in too, by Jesus. <laughs> Yes, there was a sequence in Christchurch, right? Yeah, there, with, with the wizard of the like cathedral, and for Christ's sake, you know, and they come right. back up there. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sure Mr. or Mrs. Yeah. Onion Thieves will be very pleased to hear that that scene may yet be restored. <laughs> it, could, it could reappear. <laughs> and now there's talk of a remake, of course, of Goodbye Paul Pie as well. Um, yeah. To which you have a family connection, yeah? Yeah, my son's doing it, but I'm, I'm leaving him to it, you know. I haven't had much to do with it. <laughs> Than signing rights, um, because he's got his own ideas about what he wants to do. And right. I don't know how to might do a remake of it. Um, I was suggesting they get the flight of the con jokers and chuck them out of money with their guitars and <laughs> travel the length of the country. <laughs> but they weren't that keen on that particular version of it. So. <laughs> Very good. Do we have another question? Yes, Which of your films are you most proud of and why? Which of your films are you most proud of? It doesn't of have it? to be just why. one. Yeah, it's a tricky one because uh, they're, they're, they're all different. But uh, those three New Zealand films are right up there at the top of it, you know. Um, in America, I made films for American producers who decided what the film would be about and who would be the lead players and all that. They make all those decisions and you do the best you can under that system. And I'm, I made some stuff that I thought was pretty good over there, but I didn't think I made anything as good as those three New Zealand films, Goodbye Paul Pai, Utu and the Quiet Ed. And I think that Utu is probably the best piece of cinema or the Redux version is anyway. Yeah. It's the cinematic. You, you haven't seen it, have you? Are you ready? Yeah. I've seen the Redux. Redux? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, you did. Yeah. You came and made a speech. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think that was, uh, that, I think that's cinematic. As a piece of cinema, it's, it's the strongest of the three. But it doesn't quite have the energy and and uh, anarchy of that one that <laughs> you just saw, <laughs> which has its own thing going for it. And the quiet earth has uh, got a different thing going. It's sort of, I don't know, it's more formal or something. Right. You, you uh, described, um, uh, I made a note of it, and I'm not going to be able to find it, but you, I, I think in the memo there's a really beautiful uh, way in which you uh, uh, describe Goodbye Pork Pie as a, a celebration of New Zealandness, really, and, yeah. that it's, and that it's kind of anarchic spirit is about figure, uh, figures who define success in their own terms. It's nobody else's idea of success. It's that they set their own goal and yeah. by it's, crikey, they're going to... It's their existentialist. They're going to try, try <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we thank you for that. Thank you very much. I think we might have time for one last question, if uh, there's anybody who would... Um... Yes, right there. Who helped with the aerial shots? Who helped with the aerial photography? Okay. Looks like there are a few helicopter shots in there. Yeah, Kelly shot all those. Um, we, it was, we had a lot of bad luck. It was always windy and terrible conditions every time we wanted to do helicopter stuff. So that stuff of the train going through the, mm. over to the West Coast, is, it's very uh, shaky because of that, because of the conditions. But that's, you know, you only get one go at it, so you, that, that's what you get. <laughs> right. Well, I... I detract from the fact that the, uh, I think the uh, aerial shot of the Mini at the end, uh, as he's approaching the Invercargo Cemetery, uh, with John Charles's magnificent music, and uh, the cut-ins to the close-ups of uh, Tony Barry, uh, when the whole movie has changed its direction, uh, 
I think that that's one of the really top aerial shots in New Zealand movies. Yeah, it was interesting because I was up in the chopper with him, and he was, I'd say, zoom in, and he'd say, I can't go in any, any tighter than this, that's too wobbly. And I'd say, zoom in, zoom in. <laughs> and he'd go in tighter, and my picture came up. And that's the bits we used. But somehow the out of control nature of the camera work at that point plays to the drama. But anyway, that's sort of how things work out. <laughs> Fantastic. Mm. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll join with me now in uh, thanking uh, Dr. G.P. Murphy, OENZM, <laughs> Doctor of Literature, Icon of the Arts, DGA, WGA. Thank you so much. Thank you.